Anybody happy to be in church tonight? Come on. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Uh, I am super, super excited to be in church. Uh, and you guys look amazing. Uh, who's, who, feels like, who feels like yesterday uh, was, was almost like a download from heaven? Uh, that's how I felt. Uh, it felt like freedom and deliverance in the room. And man, I feel like family uh, when I'm with you guys. And so I'm super, super excited to be uh, with you tonight. Who's ready? Who's, who's got the attitude that God's not done yet? Come on. And we're barely getting started. And uh, uh, who's already decided in their mind, I'm going to get perfect attendance? Like, who's already decided in their mind, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I want everything that God has for me. And uh, boom, come on. She said it before it even started. Do you mean you or you as in singular or you as in plural? Plural. Come on. Uh, that's awesome. And so uh, who's got a Bible? Come on. Who's got a physical Bible tonight? You, know, you already know what I'm going to say. All my AP Honors Christians. Come on. Let's go. You got physical Bibles tonight. If you got an iPad, go ahead and bust out your iPad. Uh, I love preaching on faith. Uh, I preach on faith a lot. Uh, Because I think that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think that faith unlocks so many other things. Faith unlocks provision. Faith is the anchor for hope. Uh, Faith, you need faith to be married. Come on, you need faith to start a company. You need, somebody was like, somebody gave a good amen. Like, you need faith to be married. Come on. Because you can't just see your spouse based on what you see with your natural eye. You've got to allow yourself to see that person based on what God sees in them, which is faith. Faith is God's perspective on any given circumstance. Faith is deciding I'm not going to listen to my feelings as it relates to this circumstance, but I'm going to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and I need a revelation in order to have faith about something. Other people may think it's foolish, but if I have already gotten a revelation about something, then actually it's not foolish It's totally obedient uh, to choose faith. And so I want to talk about faith, and I want to bring you to the book of Matthew, okay? Uh, We sent two sets of notes. Zach, we're going to use set number one. I I picked a sermon, then I changed my mind, then I changed my mind again. So uh, uh, we're going to go to Matthew, and and then we're going to go to John, okay? I want to create a frame for us tonight when it comes to Matthew, and then I want to put uh, a canvas inside of that frame. And, uh, and my goal is, is, is to preach. I want to, I want to do more altar time. Um, so I'm going to preach. I don't want to shortchange the sermon, but I may talk a little fast and move a little quick because I do want to get, last night up here felt so free. Is that just me? Yeah. It felt awesome. And you know what, me, what I thought, um, it almost felt like if you were here last year, it felt like we started this year where we ended last year. Like the freedom that it felt in the room on Wednesday night of last year is how it felt in here yesterday. And uh, man, I love when the Holy Spirit does that. And that means y'all came ready. It's not just the, the Holy Ghost is always ready. It means y'all came ready. So come on, let's go to Matthew. I want to go to Matthew. Uh, we're going to go to Matthew. And then we are going to go to John. Matthew, then John. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, uh, and the title of our message tonight is Breadcrumb Faith. Breadcrumb Faith. Anybody realize that sometimes uh, following God is like following a set of breadcrumbs? No? Nobody? Okay. I'll try this side of the room. (laughs) Has anybody ever felt like uh, trying to figure out what God wants me to do is like following a set of clues? (laughs) Okay, so for all the real Christians, you can like, come on, talk back to me. But for all of you who are, who are thinking to yourself, no, I know exactly what the will of God is. You're dismissed, okay? <laughs> you don't need this message. But for anyone who's ever been perplexed, confused, feeling like, man, I, I wish things were a little bit more black and white, but it's a little gray. And has God ever not given you a full answer, uh, but kind of giving you a multiple choice quiz on what you're going to do in any given circumstance. Now, I want to speak to that tonight. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. Come on, Matthew chapter 15. Uh, 
Matthew chapter 15, we're going to start reading in verse 21. I want you to then put a streamer there, and then we're going to go to John. We're going to go to John chapter 2, and we're really going to spend time in this passage where Jesus turns water to wine. He turns water to wine. So Matthew chapter 15 is where we're going to start. Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to start reading in verse 21. Uh, Verse 21. It says this, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a, come on, Jesus did not answer a, has Jesus ever just not spoken back to you? Come on, I need the real Christians today. Like, have you ever like prayed? And it's almost like, uh, I know I said the right words. I know I spent time in worship. And Jesus did not respond at all. Come on, Jesus didn't uh, answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only who? For the lost sheep of? Uh, I don't know if you've ever feel like not only is God not responding, but then he, he like offended me. Like, not only am I not going to respond, but I'm going to make it very, very clear. I ain't came for you. You a whole Canaanite. And this woman has to push past her feelings. Come on, let's keep going. Uh, not only does Jesus not answer, not only does Jesus offend this woman, but then Jesus says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the... Uh-oh. These are fighting words. This is where if I were in this passage, me and Jesus would have like, Jesus would have gotten some hands. Did you just call me a dog? Ignored? Offended? Has Jesus ever put obstacles in front of you? Let's keep going. Come on. We, we got to see the faith of this woman. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the, that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have what? Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed, what? At that moment. If there's a word that I kind of want to highlight tonight, and I'm going to kind of bring us a couple different places to, to get the point across. It's persistence. Persistence. And I, I, I wanted to preach this tonight because I think there's some of us who... We need to persist until Wednesday because we got a lot of Christians who want like a microwave anointing and God's like a crock pot God. (laughs) If you've ever like, come on, all the married folks, you ever been at work all day and like your wife's crock pot and something and then crock pot just hits you in the face. Persistence. Come on. Persistence. Um, Here we go. I I want us to, like, use this woman as as a poster child of strong faith, persistent faith, diligent faith, the kind of faith that says, I'm just not going to give up, Uh, the kind of faith like Jacob that says, I'm going to wrestle you all night long until you bless me. Come on, you tracking with me. Air five. Boom. I I want us to go to John chapter two. John chapter two. And and then we're going to go to Genesis. John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Come on, mama. And Jesus said to his disciples, who had also been invited to the wedding, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more what? Here's the verse I want to I cling to right here. Woman, why do you what? Okay, come on. The Canaanite woman got a yes or a no. Come on. No. Matthew chapter 15, she got a what? Did she let the no discourage her? Absolutely not. Did she get a yes or a no? She got a? Did she let the no discourage her? No. Anybody in the room ever got a no from God? Here's my question for you. Did you match his no with a no? Uh-oh. Or did you just accept the fact that, I don't know, this looks like God said no. Here we go. Come, come on, come on. Why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Everybody say hour. And this is the part I love. Here's my favorite part. Mary, had Mary taken Jesus at his word, what would Mary have done? She would have went and sat down. She would have taken her her seat at table number 14. 
And she would have said these words. I tried. But what does she do? She places Jesus in a very socially awkward scenario. Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. <laughs> Mary's response is, let's get these servants to help Jesus. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? When's the last time you felt like life and God and circumstances and scenarios were all saying no, but you still prepared for the miracle anyway? Mary goes, hey, just in case, Jesus is about to show up and show off. I'm going to be ready. Come on, let's keep going, let's keep going. My hour has not yet come. Uh, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with, so they filled them to the brim. Uh, go, go, go back, go back for a second, go back. Here we go. My what has not yet come? My hour. Okay, here we go. Really quick. I think sometimes we have to know the difference between what Jesus says and what Jesus means by what he says. There could totally be that the no is not a denial, but that the no is an invitation for you to push a little harder. Jesus says, woman, my hour has not yet come. Now, if I had ever called my mother woman, I'd have zero teeth, okay? I'd be up here with veneers, okay? But can, can I get a little nerdy with us? Jesus doesn't say woman to disrespect her. Jesus actually says woman to throw back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, it is the what? Woman that pushes Adam into his first sin. And in this moment, what is Eve going to do? Come on. Put, what is uh, Mary going to do? As the new Eve, she's going to push Jesus into his first miracle. Woman, why do you involve me? Okay, okay, here we go. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I, this is a funny story involving the woman in my life. My wife, okay? Uh, because Jesus makes it about time. Makes it about time. My has not yet, come on, my Power. has not yet. Come. Mary's the wrong person to say this to. If I'm married, my clapback is, my hour hadn't come. <laughs> I was a smooth 13, betrothed to be married to Joseph when the angel Gabriel interrupted my whole plan and I got pregnant with you. That's me reading in between the lines. Right? Come. My hour has not yet come. Uh, Mary's like, out? Oh, we worried about time? <laughs> we worried about convenience? You, you think it was convenient? My, my husband-to-be had to have a whole dream. An angel had to appear to this man so that he wouldn't leave me. Your time, my time hasn't, hadn't come. And here's what happens. It, I love this. What should have taken months takes minutes. You know how long it takes to make wine? Not y'all say if you don't know. <laughs> it takes minimum six months to harvest grapes, thresh grapes, ferment grapes, just to get wine. You want to know what Jesus does? This is not just a miracle of provision. Oh, I want to know who I'm preaching to tonight. It's a miracle of recapturing time. It's supposed to take months to create what? Wine. And what is supposed to take nature months to do, God does it what? In a matter of minutes. You want to know the best blessing God could give you? Is your years back. That he gives you back the years that the canker worm has eaten. The years that the enemy has eaten off of your life. And the best part about Joel when it says, I'm going to give you back years that the canker worm have eaten. The end of the verse says that, that I sent. So the, the, the locusts that ate up 
your years were sent by God because y'all was disobedient. And God still says, I had to punish you because of your disobedience. It robbed you of years, and I'm still going to give you your years back. Amen. And my wife, uh, she's amazing. When I got married, uh, Pastor Jeff, she realized I, I hadn't had a physical exam in years. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying, well, that's why I got married. So this woman could help keep me alive, you know. <laughs> so she schedules an appointment for me. And she calls me into our bedroom. She's like, hey, you have a doctor's appointment Tuesday at 9 a.m. Now, you have to be there on time and actually need to be there a little bit early. You need to be there early uh, because you've never been to this doctor before. You're grossly irresponsible. You have not been to a doc any doctor in a very long time. You need to be, your appointment's at 9. Manny, I'd get there at like 8.45 if I were you. And you know what's bad when your wife says, Pastor Manny? She's like, Pastor Manny. <laughs> you know, that's never good. <laughs> that's not like a respect. That's like, like, you should be acting better than this, you know? She has this long conversation with me about getting there on time, and then Tuesday comes. Now, there's an actual word for this scientifically. It's, it's called tidsoptomy. I, I'm, I'm optimistic about time. So I always have, I think I have more of it than I do. <laughs> and so I needed to be there at nine, you know, and I'm also, you know, I'm always cheering for myself. <laughs> you know, I don't really get down on myself a lot. So it's you're like 8.55 and I'm just getting out of the shower. <laughs> and, but in my head, I'm like, it's fine. You know, this is going to be okay. It's like 9.20, and I'm leaving the house. Okay. <laughs> Y'all are more stressed than I was. <laughs> it's 9.20, I'm leaving the house, okay? Uh, and, and now uh, I, it's about 9.30, 9.35. I get to the doctor's office, and to me, I'm thinking, no biggie. Get up to the front, and I tell them, you know, my name is Emmanuel Orango and I have a nine o'clock appointment. And the woman says to me, there is no Emmanuel Orengo in my system for nine o'clock in the morning. And I go, I don't work here. I don't know what you do to type the things into your computer, ma'am. My wife told me to show up at this address at nine o'clock in the morning. I don't, do you have notes? Can you just, can I send, can you, can you sign a note for me to bring to her to let her know I came? Like, Look, can you just, can you punch my ticket? Can you do something? Look, I got a boss to report to, okay? Her name is Tia Arango. <laughs> I'm leaving here with a doctor's note or something. <laughs> Don't send me away empty-handed. And, <laughs> and the woman, she's searching in her system, searching in her system. She's like, sir, there is no appointment in here for Emmanuel Arango at 9 o'clock. And, you know, I had to provide all the brilliant ideas, so I said, how about you to search for my name? Just my name. And she said, oh, I got gotcha. you. Sir, you have a 10 o'clock appointment. <laughs> you have an appointment today at 10 o'clock in the morning. I immediately text my wife. Oh, you're slick. <laughs> she texts back, I ain't arguing with you. <laughs> That's a smart woman right there. She went, I ain't arguing with you. Here we go. What's the point? What's the point of the story? I need you to get this. What I thought I was late for, I was actually early for. Oh, I want to prophesy to somebody today. Because there are some of you, you've been beating yourself up. Because you've been wallowing in regret. 
I wish I had done that when I was younger. I wish I had taken advantage of that opportunity. I wish I had done. I wish, I wish, I wish. And God begins to go, no, what your human timeline set you up to be late for. I am the God that can restore years to you. I can't just do miracles of wine. I do miracles of time. The real miracle is not in the wine. The real miracle is in the fact that it happened outside of the realm of natural time. I wonder if there's any Anybody in the room today who's believing God for Kairos time, accelerated time. God, I need you to restore the years that the locusts have eaten off of my life. What's the point? Okay, 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 look, come on, let's, let's, like, let's be biblical. Better is one day in your courts than what? A thousand elsewhere. A thousand elsewhere. That's like three and a half years, I think, roughly. Or something like that. Somebody can do it. 365 divided by 1,000. Whatever your calculator says. You want to know what my prayer is, actually? And I, I, I hope you, you get this. Every time I come to church, here's what my prayer is. God, let one day in your courts give me wisdom for the next two and a half years of my life. God, I want the value of the time that I spend in your presence to accelerate my wisdom to a place that what it would take five years for another, another entrepreneur to build their company to, God, let me do it in five months. God, I know there's some wisdom that we're not going to get to according to man's math until we're in our 30s, until, until we've been married for 30 years. We've only been married for 10. God, would you accelerate our relationship? Would you accelerate Time, which leads us into the story that I actually want to talk about, the story of Joseph. Because God gives Joseph a dream when he is 17 years old. And the dream doesn't come into fruition until Joseph is 39 years old. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but if... If it's going to take 22 years for God to do something, just tell me when I'm 38. <laughs> just me? No, just me. <laughs> Why tell me when I'm 17? When it's going to take 22 years for it to come to pass. And, and here's, here's how slick God is. God gives Joseph like this grand dream for his life, and then his life gets worse. <laughs> Classic God that what? Ignores, offends, puts obstacles in our way, says no to the woman who's just there for her demon possessed daughter to be healed, says no to Mary. And this is a God who says, Hey, Joseph. You're going to be amazing. You're going to be a leader. It's going to be phenomenal. And then his brothers sell him into slavery. And here we go. Here we go. Here we go. If we're going to unlock what I would call accelerated time, then that means we have to earn the trust of the Lord. Because God does not trust what God has not tested. Okay. So here we go. Joseph. Joseph walks through. 22 years. By the end of the 22 years, he finally gets to a place where he's second in command in all of Egypt. Here's the awesome thing about, about the Lord, is that the same God that was with Joseph when Joseph was working for his father is the same God that's with Joseph when Joseph is in the prison. And the same God that's with Joseph in the prison is the same God that's with Joseph in Potiphar's house. And the same God that's with Joseph in Potiphar's house is the same God that is with Joseph when he finally takes over as second in command in Egypt. Here's how you know it's the same God. Because Joseph does the exact same thing in all of the different circumstances in every season of his life. What does Joseph do when he's with his dad? He's just second in command. A really good manager. A phenomenal steward. Then Joseph gets sold into slavery, and what does he do? He's second in command, a really good steward. 
And then he, what, gets, he, not, he goes from being enslaved to being an, a slave that's in prison. That's rough. And what does Joseph do? Second in command, a good steward over everything. You want to know the temptation for a lot of us? Now that I'm in a more difficult season, I believe that God has forsaken me. And so I can't do what God called me to do when I was in a more comfortable season. And God says, no. The true test of whether or not you're anointed is that what you can do in comfort, you can do in discomfort. What you can do when everything is roses and daisies around you is the exact same thing that you can do when life gets difficult. You know, I think that the secret of Joseph's life is that he looks at all these no's and continues to believe that the same God that showed up when I was just working in the field for my dad, when I was in Potiphar's house, is the same God that's here. You want to know the lie of the enemy? The moment you get thrown into prison, the moment things get hard, the lie of the enemy is to say this, you are now wasting your time. You're never going to get this time back. And you're here and God has left you and God has forsaken you. But the breadth of scripture, the full counsel of God actually tells us the exact opposite. It's not that God has forsaken you. It's that God is testing you. It's that God has placed you in this very place to transform the negative environment. And little does Joseph know that there are people watching him walk through the worst season of his life. The cupbearer and the baker. The very people that are going to get Joseph out of prison are watching him walk through the most uncomfortable season of his life. If I were in the prison and I was sold into slavery, maybe this is just me, I'd be so concerned about all the time I was wasting with my life. God gave me this big dream. God told me all these things I was going to do, and now I'm rotting away in this prison cell. Time going by, years going by, and here's what I love. How many brothers does Joseph have? Eleven. Eleven brothers. I always like to do math. Twenty-two years between the time he has a dream and the time the dream finally comes to fruition. And in me, in my head, I go, God kept him in prison long enough for him to forgive every single brother that it actually hurt him. You know, sometimes we're angry that God hasn't accelerated us sooner, but the grace of God actually slows you down so that you don't ruin the very thing that God actually wants to bring into your life. Because Joseph finally becomes second in command, and the Bible says that Joseph's brothers walk in, and can I just be honest with y'all? No, I don't. please. There. If my brothers, who sold me into slavery, walked through the door, and I was second in command of the whole nation, and they were foreigners and strangers with no rights, okay, y'all, y'all already judging me. You already look at me like y'all judging me. Do you want to know what my words would have been? A couple of words. Guards, spear them. <laughs> That's it. Three words. Guards, (laughs) spear them. (laughs) But what would have happened if Joseph had killed his brothers? He would have killed the very dream that God had given him when he was 17 years old. In Joseph's story, time is actually... Joseph's friend. I think that sometimes we get really excited. Actually, we just did a social experiment, and it it worked. We get really excited when we talk about speeding time up. Less amens when we talk about how God slows time down. Lots of amens when we say, God can give supernatural time back to you. 
Not as many amens when you feel like, I feel like my feet are made of lead and God is slowing me down. You know what I actually think God has called us to be a massive steward of? It's time. To say this, whether I'm in a season where God is bringing me supernatural growth or whether I'm in a season where there's a supernatural delay, my job is not to manipulate or be angry with the timing of God, but to believe that if there are speed bumps along the road of life, then God is actually trying to prevent me from being this, oh, I, y'all are going to love this because, you know, everybody's like, at least my age are up in here tonight, so you're going to love this. Remember when you had to, like, actually take pictures <laughs> on, on actual devices, you know, that, that, that were not telephones? And you had to bring them to, like, CVS and Walgreens and develop them? Here's the worst thing to be. It's overexposed and underdeveloped. And so, God speeds up time. God slows time down. God speeds up time. God slows time down. That this is a God who is an author of seasons and life and time. Can I ask you a really hard question tonight? For some of us, I think we're in a season where it was slow for a long time and you're finally getting clarity on why. Because like Joseph, if God had brought the fruition of the dream any sooner, you'd absolutely ruin it. And it's the grace of God that says, yeah, I gave you the dream for that business when you were 15 and absolutely delayed it until you are 52. Because if I had done this in your life at 37, you would have killed it. And then there's some of us who we can look back at our life and go, ah, my own stupidity actually slowed things up, not God. My mistake slowed things up, not God. And now God is about to put me on those like, on those things at the airport? Those are the best things. Have you ever been at the airport and there are people not walking on them? Those people confuse me. (laughs) What are you doing? There's a whole assembly belt. Like there's a whole, there's a conveyor belt like on the ground, you know? Luke, it's actually, If my gate is past where the thing is going to let me off, I still get on it. (laughs) I'm not missing out. No, I'm just going to get on it and then backtrack. (laughs) Time. Time. Can I ask you a question? Like, Can God trust you with being content with the time that you have? Now let's go to the next point. Regret is counterfeit repentance. Regret keeps you stuck in time. Anybody ever deal with someone? My my dad was an addict for years. My dad always was full of regret for not being there. Regretful remorseful. My dad would cry. I'm so sorry I wasn't at your basketball game. I'm so sorry I wasn't at your football game. Full of, with no repentance. The trick of the enemy is to tell you this, that as long as you feel regret, that you and God are fine. Feeling regret over the time that you've lost or the time that you've wasted doesn't glorify God, and it doesn't help you. It's just a trick of the enemy to keep you stuck in whatever cycle that you're actually in. Here's grace. Grace gives you wisdom to get out of a cycle 
and actually tap into accelerated time. Because once Joseph gets out of prison, is in the palace, second in command for all of Egypt, all things start moving at an exponential pace. He begins to accelerate past the, all the different governors who had been serving in Egypt for years. And what? And because he's faithful with slow, God can trust him with fast. I think that because Mary was faithful with slow, I don't really want to be pregnant at 14, but I'll be faithful with an interruption in my, time, in my timeline. God lets her experience this miracle of time. We celebrated Pentecost Sunday yesterday, actually, and this is an awesome story because on Pentecost Sunday, Mary's there. There's all these pivotal moments throughout the New Testament where Mary gets to live in to an old woman. She gets to witness all this stuff. Why? Because she's faithful with slow. And God begins to accelerate her time. Here's my favorite thing about the Joseph story. Uh, actually, if you're taking notes, here we go. The, God actually gives Joseph three tests. You can write these down. God gives Joseph three tests. First test. It's a test of power. Because the temptation in Genesis uh, with Potiphar is actually not a temptation uh, that's completely sexual in nature. It's actually a temptation of power. Potiphar puts him in control of everything except one thing. And Joseph has to practice enough what? Self-control to not covet the one thing that he's not supposed to have power over. The next test is a test of prison. He's put in solitary confinement, isolation. The thing that I love about the test of prison is that before prison, Joseph could only have dreams. It's in prison that he begins to interpret dreams. Because sometimes the hardest things in life are the seasons that actually turn your gift into an anointing. Joseph is gifted before prison, but it is Gethsemane that turns a raw gift into an anointing. Let me break down Gethsemane for you. Jesus is praying in the garden of what? Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means olive press. It's the place where olives go from being olives to becoming what? Oil. And the only way for olives to become oil is to what? Crush them. It's pain. Brutal pain and crushing that turns your raw gift into an anointing. What's the anointing? The anointing is the supernatural power of God that goes beyond just a gift, but is actually the thing that can transform life. If you're taking notes, the anointing of God is always in direct opposition to the stronghold that what the enemy has set up. An anointing is always for an assignment, a generation, and a season. The anointing of God. It's generational. The enemy has uh, Jezebel, so that means God anoints Elijah to counter whatever the enemy is doing. The anointing of God. It's the thing that other people can't really explain why you're good at what you're good at. Prison is, uh, no one can see Joseph's gift, totally hidden. Away from limelight, away from cameras, because God doesn't want you to be underdeveloped and overexposed. I don't know if anybody's ever been to this awesome place. It's called Home Goods. Come on, Air Five. Anybody ever been at Home Goods? Once I moved out the hood, Home Goods is my jam. Home Goods is like peak suburban experience right there. It's true. <laughs> Ain't no home goods in the hood. Okay. 
There are so many times where me and my wife, we just go to Home Goods. Especially like they get like a new shipment on Tuesday. It's, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> my wife like at Home Goods Tuesday morning. And my wife likes to use this really offensive term with me. It's hard for me to even say it. It's a, it's a, a budget. <laughs> Here we go. Whew. It's like really hard for me to like articulate. I'm sorry. You know, she's a stickler on the, on the budget. There we go. It's not a good word. She, she weaponizes it, you know, against me. It's like we're walking around Home Goods, and I don't know if you've ever been in Home Goods, you start falling in love with items. I develop emotional attachments to the things that I've placed in my cart, especially coffee mugs. And so I put a bunch of things in the cart, and my wife, we get to the checkout, and my wife goes, hey, we're over. <sighs> Budget. We're over budget. You got to go put your, your coffee mug back. And I don't know if you've ever tried this trick on your wife. I go, hey, I'll just pay for it. And my wife immediately says, we have a shared bank account, bro. <laughs> nice try. I'm like, dang it. So I do what any normal person would do. Anybody, this is what every logical person would do. I take the coffee mug and I go find like a random pot <laughs> and I stick the coffee mug inside of the pot. And then I go find some towels and I wrap the pot in some towel. You're acting like you don't do this. Am I, am I actually the only person who does this? And then I go find a laundry hamper and I stick the pot that has the coffee mug that's wrapped up in a towel in a hamper and just hide it in a corner of the store. No one else does this? I'm, a, I'm shocked. I'm a smart man. Because here's what I know. I'm getting paid on Friday. And I'm coming back. I heard of that's right over. I'm coming back for my coffee mug. Get this. The better I hide it, the more I want it. The better I hide it, it means the more I want it. Which means God had to hide me. As the son of a drug addict, in a delinquent school system, in the wrong town, with a dysfunctional family, because the more God hides you, the more he actually needs you for his divine purposes in the earth. So Joseph is hidden, not just in slavery, but now I'm an enslaved prisoner. Because God doesn't hide things that he throws away. He hides things that he needs to develop over time. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, I feel like I've just wasted so many years of my life. I could have been so further along. Can I encourage you, friend? You're the coffee mug. Wrapped up in a towel. Placed in a pot put in a hamper in the corner of the store. And God has all of the funds to come get you out of whatever circumstance he had to hide you in. Some of us may wonder, Jesus should have been, I don't know, like Herod's son or something. Why wasn't he royalty? The reason that God hides Jesus in a manger with a teenage mom and so that Herod actually doesn't know where to find him because the enemy always wants to abort what God wants to do 
before you are fully formed and fully developed to actually be a full-blown threat to the enemy. That is the plan of the enemy all throughout the Bible. Pharaoh tries to kill Moses when Moses is a child. But what happens? Mom hides Moses in a basket, puts him down the Nile, and you want to know the irony of the story? The very boy that Pharaoh's trying to kill ends up at his house. <laughs> Pharaoh gives a decree, kill all the babies two and under. Me Moses' mom hides this boy as long as she can. Finally, you know how hard it is to hide a baby? I have one of these things. <laughs> There's no volume control on them. They're just loud. They're born really loud. The Bible says that she hides him until she can't hide him anymore. Puts him in a basket. The actual Hebrew word is ark. Puts him in an ark. Puts him in the river. Now, why would God now allow Moses to live disconnected from his family, disconnected from his people, disconnected from his language, now hidden in an Egyptian culture that he doesn't belong in? I'll tell you exactly why God would not just hide Moses in a basket, but then hide Moses in a palace with people who are not related to him. He doesn't fit in. It's clear that he feels like he doesn't fit in. Why? Because slaves don't know how to read or write. Oh, come on. Slaves don't know how to what? Read or write. And Moses is called to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So God hides him amongst people who hate him so that they can train him with the best education in the ancient Near Eastern culture so that he can be prepared to actually accomplish the will of God that's on his life. You can be hidden in a basket. You can be hidden in a prison. You can be hidden in a palace. Oh, hiding is not just about how comfortable or uncomfortable the scenario is. Hiding is about you don't feel like you belong where you are God hides things that are a threat to the enemy he hides people and he hides them in time he hides them in dysfunction he hides them in plain sight for some of us I remember feeling these words looked over looked over always just wanted people to acknowledge my gift. I started preaching at 13, but what I never tell people is actually the first place I started preaching was a nursing home. Have you ever preached at a nursing home? 13 years old, I told my youth pastor, I feel called to preach. My youth pastor said, okay, great. Show up at my house Sunday morning at 8 a.m. I'm thinking he's about to take me to a church. This is about to be amazing. I get to his house, I'm suited up. He goes, all right, we're going to the nursing home. Mr. Taylor's getting like pills while I'm preaching, you know what I'm saying, like it's, it's a nursing home. My youth pastor would play, he would teach me how to preach by saying, okay, you're gonna preach on the sixth floor, but then I want you to do a different sermon for the seventh floor then a different sermon for the eighth floor. Hey, actually, I want you to preach a different sermon, but from the same text. Okay, today, I want you to do a different text but, uh, and just play preaching games with me until I was 16 years old. At 16, I finally got a little annoyed. I'm like, okay, Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> <laughs> I want to preach to teenagers. My youth pastor said, okay, great. Meet me at my house Thursday at 5 p.m. I go, all right, great, yeah, I can do that. I'm like, I look cool, you know, I'm like, I got to go preach to teenagers my own age. My youth pastor brings me to a juvenile detention center. 
by the time I was 18 and I started preaching at youth group, none of the kids at my youth group intimidated me. Just hidden. Hidden. And then finally, when I felt like I wasn't hidden anymore, God sticks me on a college campus where nobody knows me. And then finally, I feel like I'm not hidden anymore, and he tells me to move to North Carolina. I'm like, oh, now I'm at this new church. I'm at a mega church, and I'm working at Nordstrom selling women's shoes. It's a true story. I've got, I've paid $40,000 a year for college to learn the Bible. And I'm getting a size nine for Susan. (laughs) This is Ed Nordstrom being faithful. And then one day out of nowhere, senior pastor of a 10,000 member church walks into Nordstrom. I thought to myself, great, I'm going to make commission today. I'm going to sell this man every pair of shoes we've got in here. He's trying on shoes. He looks at me and he says, like, you want to do this forever? And I went, absolutely no. Please, are you here to deliver me? What, what? <laughs> he says, hey, I need a youth pastor. Do you want to be my youth pastor? I didn't ask what the health insurance benefits were. I did not ask how much he was going to pay me. I didn't know how much they were going to pay me until I got my first check. <laughs> then I'm the youth pastor, and God says, move to Dallas, Texas. You don't want to know what life, a series of God hiding you over and over and over and over again so that you will believe that it's never your reputation, it's never your gift, it's never you, it's God making a platform for you. Where there is no platform, it's God elevating you when you just kept trusting him to be hidden again and hidden again and hidden again and hidden again and and uncomfortable over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. We can play keys because everything sounds more spiritual when you play keys. Canaanite woman. She has to cross a border into Israel just to talk to Jesus. She's uncomfortable. Jesus offends her. Says no. Calls her a dog. And her response is, I didn't come to you with my feelings. I came here with my faith. What I need from you is more important than you making me feel comfortable. Mary, time structure totally interrupted in her life. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. Being pregnant as a teenager is just rough. And not just pregnant as a teenager, but it's drama. I put my wife in a vehicle at eight months pregnant. She felt uncomfortable. Homegirl's on a donkey. (laughs) All the way to Bethlehem, just uncomfortable. Matthew actually in the birth narrative keeps emphasizing that although things are really difficult for Mary and Joseph, no room in an inn, I gotta give birth outside with animals? This is ridiculous. You wanna know what Matthew keeps emphasizing over and over and over, that this baby is Emmanuel. God with us. God, if you were with me, why am I in slavery? If you are with me, why am I in prison? If you're with me, why did my brothers throw me in a cistern and lie to my debt? If you're with me, why did you ignore me? If you're with me, why did the wine run out at the wedding? If you're with me, if you're with me, can things just start going a little bit more smoothly? Here we go. I want to just one change. Actually, if if you don't get anything else out of this message, like this is it right here. We have been taught that God is the God that prevents. 
but I need you to swap the V out for an S. He's not the God that prevents drama or craziness. No, he's the God that's present in drama, in craziness, in turmoil, in prison, in trial, at the inn, in the manger, at the wedding, when the wine's gone, in the middle of, in the middle of you feeling uncomfortable, but he's present, present, present. Whether Moses is floating down a river or in a palace that he feels like he doesn't belong in. God doesn't pre-vent. He is present. Last thing I'm going to say. Come on, let's break down this word present. Can we break this word down? He's what? Present. Come on, he's what? He's present. He's, he's what? He's present. He's present. He's present. Which means he's always present. Which means what you call late, God just calls present. What you say is not according to my timeline, God says present. And present means pre sent. God pre sends. Joseph gets to the prison. God's like, I've been waiting for you. I'm right here. You've been having a lot of dreams. Time to interpret them. Joseph's not excited. God's like, I've been waiting here. Because I'm always. God's in the future right now, present. God's in your past right now, present. God's right here, right now, present. Mary finds out the news. I'm going to be pregnant. And God's right there like, been waiting right here for this miracle. God's drama. And God goes, well, guess what? I pre sent myself to meet you right where you are. Hardest day of my life was actually followed by one of the best days of my life. I'm not even sure if I've ever shared this story at this church. If I have, I have, sorry share it again best day of my life was the first time that my wife got pregnant hardest day of my life is when we walked into an ultrasound to to hear the heartbeat of our miracle baby for the first time and the nurse looked up really awkward and said there's no heartbeat and I was so confused because we had walked through infertility for five years and now the blessing that was in my mouth has turned bitter. And I remember being angry and broken and upset and confused. How can God give us a miracle and then take it away? I'm not as saved as my wife. <laughs> I'm not as saved as this woman. At that time, I thought to myself, I wish we had never gotten pregnant. My wife actually said these words. I'm just glad for the eight weeks I got to spend as a pregnant woman. Fast forward, we finally got pregnant again. We're in the ultrasound room, same hospital, same exact room, same exact nurse and my PTSD is triggered because it's the exact same place that we found out that we were having a miscarriage the last time. I said, God, why are we here again? And I remember God saying, because this is where you buried all of your pain. And I need you to dig all that up 
I was present the last time you were in this room. I'm present this time you were in that room. And I remember hearing my kid's heartbeat for the very first time. And we would have been full of trauma the whole pregnancy, scared, had we not put some kind of firewall up of healing between the first time and the second time. Can I tell you tonight, God's present. If you're in the room and you're frustrated, you've been asking God, why am I in a holding pattern? Why haven't you done things quicker in my life? But tonight you're deciding, I'm going to trust God's timing. If that's you, just wave at me. I need to trust God's timing. I need to trust God's timing. If you're in the room and you believe that God was supposed to prevent everything, but actually he's just been present in everything, and you've been numb to his presence because you actually had the wrong theology around who he is, come on, wave at me. Wave at me. Wave at me. Wave at me. You know what? If you raise your hand on either of those, come on, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Wherever you are, come on, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Last one. Last one. I want to know who I'm praying for tonight. You feel looked over, hidden, placed in uncomfortable circumstances. You don't fit in in any environment. And you've always questioned, God, why would you put me in this family <laughs> or this church or this scenario? And God keeps hiding you and hiding you and hiding you. And it's, you've thought it's because he didn't care that he's the God that's forsaken. But actually, he's the God that's hiding out with you, present, developing you in secret places. Come on, if that's you, lift up your hand, wave at me, stand up. Come on, all over the place. I want to pray tonight. I want to pray tonight. If you're in the room, I know what it feels like to wait for a long time. And every year we waited to get pregnant, I felt like God was turning us into the right people to actually be the parents that he wanted us to be. If you're in the room tonight, you feel like you've been waiting for a long time and you've been complaining about the waiting, but tonight you're gonna switch your mindset. Say, I'm not gonna complain about waiting I'm actually going to embrace the development that God has for me. Come on, lift up your hands. I want to pray for you. God, we thank you for every believer. You know what? Come on, make your way down here. The altar's open. You just make your way down here. The altar's open. The altar's fully open. You're saying, I need to be faithful with the slow. Because if I'm not faithful with the slow, God can't trust to ele accelerate my time. Come on, all over the room. Got to ask that your people would be faithful in whatever season they're in. Faithful. Faithful in every single season. I declare you're not hidden. God's with you. God's present with you. He's training you. He's molding you, developing you into the person that he wants you to be. God, we thank you right now that whatever lie of the enemy that has been present, God, we ask that that lie would be torn down. That God, that we